the Bohr model of the atom, and atomic spectra are going to be the topics of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now in the last lesson we saw that Planck and Einstein came up with some quantum theories, simply saying that energy was quantized, both to explain the data for black body radiation as well as the photoelectric effect. Well, in 1915, Niels Bohr made his contribution coming up with a quantum theory for the atom, or at least for the hydrogen atom anyways, saying that the electron energies in an atom were similarly quantized. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So Planck and Einstein came up with their theories and the associated equations for both black body radiation and the photoelectric effect because these quantized theories fit the data. Well, in similar fashion, Niels Bohr in 1915 came up with a quantum model of the atom where the electron energies were quantized. And the reason he did it as well is because it fit the data specifically for the atomic spectra for the hydrogen atom. And sometimes these atomic spectra are called the line spectra because certain lines of colors, or at least of wavelengths or frequencies or energies, however you want to look at it, uh, exist. And these en encompass both absorption spectra and emission spectra. Absorption spectra, where photons of light are being absorbed, they're the missing photons in white light, if you will, or emission spectra, where it's only certain uh, colors, if you will, wavelengths, frequencies, energies that are being emitted so as well. And it turns out these different absorption and emission lines are different for different elements, but they can be used. They always occur at those same places for those elements and can be used. It's kind of like a signature for that element. Now, it turns out he was able to explain the data specifically for hydrogen, but it turns out his model didn't work for anything having more than one electron. Now, if you kind of had some heavier elements, but you peeled off all the electrons except for one, he could make a model and an equation for that. So, but for anything that had more than one electron, two or greater, his model completely broke down. Well, we now know that there's some problems with his model, that it's not completely correct, but we do give him tremendous credit. One, he did fit the data, and he did pr propose a, a quantized model, which is indeed true of nature. All right, so there's three major tenets to Bohr's model of the atom. So one, he said that uh, electrons live in circular orbits going about the nucleus. Well, that would mean they're two-dimensional. We now know they kind of live in three-dimensional orbitals. So but his model said they live in two-dimensional circular orbits at very specific radii, because those very specific radii, if you look at it from a, a potential energy perspective, are gonna correspond to very specific values of potential energy. Now you might recall that in the nucleus, there are protons and neutrons, and therefore the overall charge on a nucleus is always going to be positively charged due to those protons. Well, electrons are negative, so there's an attraction between the electrons in these orbits so, and the positive protons in the nucleus. Now, if you recall, if I take two things that are attracted to each other, and right now this marker is attracted to the ground through gravity, and if I bring those two things that are attracted to each other closer together, it lowers their potential energy. Same thing is gonna be true here. The closer I can get the electron to that nucleus, the lower its potential energy is going to be. And it turns out the second tenet is that the energy of these electrons in these orbits corresponds to a very simple equation where n here just is any integer starting at number one. And so in this case, the energy of an electron is negative 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules over n squared. And so the first orbit that's closest to any called n equals one, and that's the lowest possible energy for an electron in the hydrogen atom. And then the next orbit out would be n equals two, n equals three, n equals four. And again, he was just trying to, to match the data for the line spectra. All right, so if we look, we plug in number one there, then you find out that the energy of an electron in that first orbit is just negative 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. That the electron in the second orbit would just be this value over four. You can also express it in electron volts there, by the way. So, but if you divide this number by four, you get negative 5.45 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. If you plug in three and square it, four and square it, five and square it, six and square it, you get these other values right here. And it turns out this goes up to infinity. And by the time you put infinity squared in there, well, you divide by infinity squared, you get zero. And so what's weird is that the first orbit has the lowest value for energy 
because it's the most negative. And as you get higher and higher and higher, eventually if you get to the infinitieth orbit, well, that's when the energy reaches its maximum and is zero. So, and if the electron, which is negative, is infinitely far from that positively charged nucleus, that's when it would have zero associated potential energy. So that's kind of how this works. Now, the third tenet here, so is that uh, electrons can jump between orbits, and when they do, it is always accompanied by a photon of light. Now, if you jump from a lower potential energy where you're closer to the nucleus and move further out to a higher potential energy orbit, you're going to need to absorb a photon of light. And the energy of the photon will be exactly the difference in energy between the electron and those two orbits. Now, if you go the other way, and the electron, we call it, relaxes from a higher energy orbit that's further away from the nucleus, to a lower energy orbit that's closer to the nucleus, then it's going to emit a photon. And the energy of that photon will again be exactly that difference in energy. So by proposing these energy levels here for these circular orbits with these exact values, what he started looking then and saying, oh, if it's the difference in these values that have to correspond to the line spectra, the atomic spectra for hydrogen. And so if we look, we can kind of look at the emission spectra for just a second. So we have some different options. So what they would do is they would zap uh, some atoms of hydrogen with electricity, which would excite, we say, the electrons, moving them further out. So, and depending on the hydrogen atoms, some of them might, uh, the electron, it turns out that hydrogen has a single electron, usually exists in that first orbit, the lowest energy orbit. That's kind of what we call the ground state. When you zapped it with electricity, for some atoms, it would jump out to two, some to three, some to four, some to five, all the way out to infinity and so on and so forth, depending on the, uh, the energy of the electricity and stuff like this. And what you'd find is that for some of the electrons that are relaxing down, they would go all the way back to one. And if they'd started at six, they could drop down to one and it'd be a big difference in energy and therefore a fairly high energy photon. If they started in n equals five orbit, then they go from five to one, it'd be a little less energy photon that's being emitted. Four to one, three to one, two to one, so on and so forth. And, and, and I, again, I'm only going up to six here, but this goes up to infinity. Well, as long as you're dropping down to that first orbit, we call this the Lyman series. And these are fairly large energies. They typically correspond to ultraviolet radiation. Now notice the bomber I've kind of got written in a different color because it's special. So these are lower energy changes, if you will, in, in, in these uh, changes in orbits, and they are lower energy than the ultraviolet ones we saw here. And the reason it's highlighted is these are typically the ones we can actually see with our eyes. They correspond to the visible spectrum. Then you move on to the Paskin and Bracken, where here Paskin is when you drop down to the third orbit from anything higher, and the Bracken is the series of, of spectral lines that will result from when you drop down to the fourth orbit. So, and these are going to be lower than the visible spectrum, typically in the infrared spectrum. So, uh, you should definitely know the Bomber series. It corresponds to the visible lines in the spectrum. So, and it involves having the final orbit you drop down to as n equals 2. Now, the truth is, if you wait long enough, even the electrons that drop down to here in the certain atoms, they're probably eventually going to drop down to one later on and get to that most stable place. So, this, uh, this idea of exciting these electrons is a very temporary and transient process uh, on the order of like picoseconds and things of this sort. So, all right, but these different lines so that we could see based on the exact energies of the electrons could only take on very specific values. And those are the values we see for the uh, hydrogen's line spectra. And that's where Bohr kind of used his model to fit the data, if you will. That's where he got this value for the possible constant and saw that it was just related to simple integer values, which is crazy. Uh, and it turns out, again, his model was wrong. So electrons don't live in circular orbits, they live in orbitals. And where this, what we are gonna end up calling the principal quantum number comes from, it actually falls out of solutions to the Schrodinger equation, and it's much more complicated than Bohr could have believed. But again, we give Bohr a lot of credit because he came up with a quantized model, and it fit the data at least for hydrogen. Now it turns out you can't get a simple equation for this once you have more than one electron. So because this model only takes a look at potential energy between that one electron and the nucleus. But the moment you have two electrons, you now have repulsions going on as well between those two electrons, and that can't be factored in to a simple equation like this one. So, so Bohr kind of knew right off the bat that his model probably wasn't completely correct uh, and, and things of his sort, uh, uh, and it got more complicated in a hurry, but uh, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, we got a much more complete model, and we'll take a look at that in the next lesson.
Okay, so we got a couple other equations here. So we can take a look at the difference in energy between any two orbits. And if we factor out that constant, the negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules, or technically you could use the negative 13.6 electron volts. So then you get one over n1 squared minus one over n2 squared quantity times that constant to get the difference in energy between any two orbits. And again, the energy of the photon that's either absorbed or emitted is exactly equal to that difference in energy. And so now we have an equation that we can use for such a calculation. Now it turns out we've got one other similar one here. So, and that's this guy here where we can use to solve for the wavelength of the different photons that are going to be given off in an emission spectra or absorbed in an absorption spectrum. So in this lovely constant here is what we call the Rydberg constant, R sub H. So, and it can be used in the same fashion. And so again, a, a very simple equation in terms of two integer values to actually calculate the wavelength of the different spectral lines for hydrogen. Now you can use either one of these, and ultimately, if you look, this one's gonna get you the energy of the photon, but recall that the energy of the photon was equal to hc over lambda. And so that's why you have kind of two similar looking equations with a different constant, because one's getting you energy, one's getting you the wavelength, and they're related to each other by h and c, Planck's constant and the speed of light. So it turns out we're gonna do just one example problem here. And the question says, calculate the energy and wavelength of the photon emitted when an electron relaxes from n equals two to n equals one in a hydrogen atom. And so effectively, we're just doing this process here. We've got an electron that's gonna be going from the n equals two orbit to the n equals one orbit. So because we're going from higher potential energy to lower potential energy, we're going to emit a photon. And one thing you should know about these equations right here, so what you plug in for n1 and what you plug for n2 is a little bit arbitrary, but here's the deal. So if you kind of make it, you know, n final minus n initial or something like that, so, well, then if delta E comes out to be negative, that means it's a release of energy and it's a, uh, the energy of the emitted photon. If delta E comes out positive in such case, well, then it's a photon of light that's being absorbed. So, and then the energy of the photon you're calculating is the energy of the absorbed photon. Now, here's the deal though with wavelengths. There's no such thing as a negative wavelength. And so what you're supposed to do here is choose your values of N1 and N2 so that your wavelength never comes out negative but comes out positive instead. So uh, if you choose the wrong way, I, I usually just mindlessly plug the two values in and my wavelength comes out negative, I just make it positive and know I did it backwards. All right, but technically the way this would work is you wanna plug in the lower number for N1 and the higher number for N2. That way your wavelength would come out positive in such cases. All right, so we've got a couple different ways to go here. So one, we can calculate the difference in energy here. So for going from two to one. And there's a couple different ways we can do this. One, we have the energy of an electron in that second orbit and the energy of an electron in that first orbit, and we can just take the difference between the two. And so in this case, if we do final minus initial, then we do the negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules that guy, E1 minus E2, which is minus a negative 5.45 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So we'll let our calculator do the heavy lifting for us. All right, so negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 minus a negative, i.e. plus, 5.45 times 10 to the negative 19 is going to get us uh, negative 1.635. So negative 1.64 times 10 to the negative 18. And this is the energy of our photon. All right, now this isn't the only way we could go about making this calculation. So here I just used the actual energy values, but I had them conveniently uh, handy right there. We could also just plug in the N1 and N2 values here and do uh, N1 for one and N2 for two and do the similar calculation. So in such cases, we would just say delta E equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. 
times one over one squared minus one over two squared. And if we plug that in, so notice one over one squared is still one and minus one fourth. So one minus one fourth would be three fourths of this number, which is exactly that right there, but we'll work it out. So uh, three fourths times negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 gets us negative 1.635 times 10 minus 18 or negative 1.64, same diff. So a couple different ways to skin a cat here. Now we also wanted that wavelength and we got a couple different ways we can go about that as well. Now that we've got this energy of the photon, so, and again, it's negative, just telling us that it's being emitted. So, but now that we've got that value, we could plug that into energy right here, rearrange this to solve for lambda and see that lambda is equal to HC over the energy. So and just plug in Planck's constant, the speed of light and divide by that energy there and we'd get the wavelength. And assuming we're using all SI units, it would come out in joules. And we'd have to just drop the negative sign. That just told us that the photon was being emitted, that energy was being released, but we drop the negative sign and plugging it in here. That way we'd still come out with a positive wavelength. And that would be one way to go about it. Now, the other way you can calculate that, this out is using the Rydberg constant in this version to get that wavelength, in which case we'd end up with, and this is probably the more likely calculation you're going to do. So one over lambda equals 1.096776 times 10 to the seventh inverse meters times, in this case, one over one squared minus one over two squared. And again, if you want your wavelength to come out positive like it should be, Put the smaller number first and the bigger number second. That way you get one over one is one and one over four. So one minus one fourth is positive three fourths. If you put these backwards, you would have got negative three fourths and got the exact negative for your wavelength. So in this case, one over lambda is going to equal, all right, 1.096776 times 10 to the seventh times effectively three fourths, which is gonna be 8225820. That's going to have units of inverse meters, and that's what one over the wavelength equals. And so your wavelength would just equal one over this. So if we do one divided by that last answer, we're going to get 1.2156, so 1.22, little round of two, times 10 to the negative seven meters, or 122 nanometers. Uh, would work as well. Now again, you could have also got the same answer here using this version here, H times C over that energy that we calculated right back here. So and if you did it that way, you'd have 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 for Planck's constant H times the speed of light, three E to the eighth, and then divided by this guy here, which was technically 1.635 times 10 to the negative 18. And you're gonna wanna plug in the absolute value that way you're, uh, again, if you plug in a negative energy, you'll get a negative wavelength. If you just use the absolute value, you'll get the positive value for the wavelength. And in this case, we get 1.215, so 1.22 times 10 to the negative seven meters that way as well. So a lot of different ways to skin a cat here with these calculations. If you have found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.